Hey everyone, I'm the Canadian Lad, and I have watched Oppenheimer four times consecutively over a week and found 23 incredible hidden details and deeper meanings. Now, if you don't know me, well, I watch movies at pointy fabric speed and try to find hidden details and Easter eggs. But for this movie, I couldn't really do that, since there's literally no action scenes or CGI scenes to break down in slow motion. However, I did watch all the Florence Pugh scenes at pointy fabric speed for my own sanity and nuclear chain reaction. Now, speaking of nuclear strikes, Today's video sponsor is War Thunder. War Thunder is a free-to-play, large-scale multiplayer action game featuring ground, air, and naval combat, and is available on PC, PlayStation, Xbox, and Mac. In War Thunder, you can experience all advanced military technologies like guided missiles, active protection systems, smoke screens, night vision devices, and even reconnaissance and strike drones, or a nuclear strike that can flatten the entire map. War Thunder constantly improves on graphics, physics, and sound to ensure the best immersive atmosphere for players with the dynamics of a Hollywood blockbuster. A recent update called Alpha Strike has been added where players can explore Hungarian aviation and an array of modern and classic equipment with improved visuals, and a new map for intense tank and aviation battles, North Holland. Fight in the red light district or create a small apocalypse in the shopping center. So download War Thunder for free through the link in description. All new players and those who haven't played War Thunder for half a year or more will receive some special bonuses, like rentals for the P-40E-1 aircraft and M4 tank for a week, along with free unique skins for them, a special decorator Eagle of Valor, 100,000 silver lines, three premium vehicles for free, a week of premium account, and even more. So hurry up, the American vehicle bonus season will end soon. Number 1. One of the first tests we see in the movie just before the big trinity test, everyone, including General Groves, reacts to the loud noise and falling debris. However, Oppenheimer doesn't react at all. This could be because the director Chris Nolan likely told Killian Murphy not to flinch, because in a Chris Nolan movie, every detail is deliberate. This implies that Oppenheimer was very determined to get to the Trinity test, so a small test like this didn't bother him. It also shows his intelligence in understanding what to expect from such an explosion. Number 2. Inside the bunker, Oppenheimer admits to Groves that there's a slight chance that a nuclear chain reaction might set fire to the atmosphere itself, therefore destroying the entire planet. And then he says whether the planet will catch fire or the test will work, we will find out in exactly 1 hour and 58 minutes, the time until detonation. In exactly 1 hour, 58 minutes, we'll know. Now, after the bomb goes off, Oppenheimer's brother Frank says it worked at exactly 1 hour and 58 minute mark of the movie. It worked. Talk about attention to detail, eh? Number 3. The first time we see Niels Bohr in this movie is when Oppenheimer attends one of his lectures. Now notice on the blackboard, we can see an atomic model. Now it goes without saying that Niels Bohr won a Nobel Prize for his work on the structure of atoms, where he said electrons were able to occupy only certain orbits around the nucleus. His atomic model was the first to use quantum theory. And this model being here not only fits Bohr's character, but also the plot of the movie, because Oppenheimer played a crucial role in advancing quantum theory in the United States. Number 4. Robert Oppenheimer was under constant surveillance by the US government after he came forward about an interaction with the communist spy. Now the movie shows this in a very clever way, because in real life, Robert Oppenheimer did become aware of it and even joked about it. But when his interview with Colonel Pash was wear tapped in 1943, Oppenheimer still didn't know that he was being surveilled. And this brings me to my detail. When Oppenheimer in the movie reveals for the first time to Officer Johnson that he may have information on communist spies. And I wanted to give you a heads up on, uh, on a man named Eltonton, just that he might merit watching is all. Notice Mr. Johnson's desk had a normal looking lamp. But then Oppenheimer said he was in a hurry, so Mr. Johnson asked him to come back the next day for a detailed talk. Cut to the next day, Mr. Johnson now wears his military uniform and Colonel Pash is there too, which already established that they're here for serious business. But notice the lamp from the previous day is now changed. It's because they planted a listening device to record Oppenheimer. The illegal recording of this interview would later come back to haunt Oppenheimer in his appeal. Now this is by far one of the best details in the movie, because just like Oppenheimer, didn't know about the surveillance yet, the audience too doesn't notice the lamp change, indicating we're seeing the movie from Oppenheimer's perspective. So if he doesn't see something, we don't see it. And that's absolute brilliant work from Chris Nolan. 
Number 5. When Oppenheimer meets with President Truman in the Oval Office, notice this particular painting. This is a painting of Jose de San Martin, an Argentinian hero of War of Independence. President Truman actually had this painting in the Oval Office. Number 6. Whenever Oppenheimer would face stress, anxiety, and uncertainty about the Manhattan Project, we start hearing the thumping noises. When did you see her after that? Later we learn that these are noises from the food stomping of people celebrating the bombing of Hiroshima. So whenever Oppenheimer would face a dilemma, he would always hear this stomping noise. But when the people in this hall room were actually stomping their feet, that's when Oppenheimer stops hearing these noises, as complete silence takes over him. I just wish we had it in time to use against the Germans! Now I believe these noises symbolize Oppenheimer's inner guilt. Whenever he would think about the consequences of his actions, like creating the atomic bomb or his relationship with Gene Tadlock, he zones out and we hear the stomping noise. But when his guilt becomes real in this room, the noise disappears. Because now he no longer has to hear it, he is living it. Indicating that right from the beginning of the movie, Oppenheimer feared this moment and its consequences. He moved forward with his mission despite his fears. And now he faces complete silence. The stomping noise could also be a sonic representation of a nuclear isotope reaching supercritical, meaning that one or more fission events will result from the previous fission event. Or, to say it in an even simpler fashion, this noise represents a nuclear chain reaction. It starts slowly and gets faster and louder each time we hear it, eventually becoming a wall of noise. The tempo continues to increase to the point where each sound has sped up so much that it becomes inseparable from one another. And listen to what Oppenheimer said to Einstein right at the end of the film. We thought we might start a chain reaction that would destroy the entire world. What of it? I believe we did. And right after saying he started a chain reaction, we hear the stomping noise for one last time, and this time the loudest and the fastest. So it's like a double metaphor, representing both the chain reaction Oppenheimer fears and his inner guilt. Number 7. In scenes set at Los Alamos, many scientists and technicians are shown writing with their left hands. This detail is likely a tribute to the significant number of left-handed scientists who were involved in the Manhattan Project. Left-handedness among scientists was notably prevalent during that time. And incorporating this detail into the film just goes to show the level of attention to detail from Chris Nolan. Number 8. President Truman dismissed Oppenheimer's concern of Russia developing their own nuclear weapons. And, and, and I'm concerned. Do you know when the Soviets are gonna have the bomb? Never. Never. This is actually accurate, because in real life when President Truman was told about a detonation in Russia in 1949, he was actually taken by surprise. So much so that he even ordered a double check on this report, because he never believed Russia would be capable of developing their own atomic bomb. Number 9. In 1959, President Eisenhower nominated Louis Strauss for the position of Secretary of Commerce. This, of course, was a very controversial nomination, leading to some very intense Senate hearings. And notice in the movie version, the audience noticeably grows between the first and the last Senate hearings. This attention to detail blows my mind because Strauss's hearings did become a significant national story in 1959 by the time Dr. Hill testified, and the growing audience in the background during the Senate hearings is a visual representation of that. Another cool fact about this hearing is that between 1925 and 1989, only one nominee was rejected by the Senate, and that was Louis Strauss. Number 10. While delivering a speech celebrating the bombing of Hiroshima, Oppenheimer has disturbing thoughts about the people suffering from the bomb's effects. One of these visions is of a young woman whose skin appears to peel off her face. Interestingly, this woman is portrayed by Flora Nolan, Christopher Nolan's daughter. Number 11. In the opening scenes, Oppenheimer's title card reads Fission, while Strauss's says Fusion. This appears to be a clever symbolic parallel between Oppenheimer and Louis Strauss. Oppenheimer struggles with self-doubt and ethical debates, his personality seeming to split inwardly, much like the process of nuclear fission that he unleashes. On the other hand, Robert Downey Jr.'s charismatic portrayal of Louis Strauss propels forward relentlessly, reflecting the fused power of a hydrogen bomb. Their differences and conflicts ignite dramatic reactions that move the story forward. Number 12. Towards the end of the movie, we learn that Klaus Fuchs was actually a spy who was supplying information to the Soviets. Now, director Chris Nolan actually planted two hidden clues that foreshadowed this outcome. I'm gonna play out the scenes for you and then explain it. Head down, everybody. Fuchs, head down. 
Hooks, head down. Okay. Everybody ready? Notice in both instances, Fuchs was more focused on observing the bomb tests rather than listening to the safety instructions. It's because he was taking notes in his head, which he would later pass to the Soviets. And I think this is a great hidden detail for anyone who's gonna watch the movie more than once. Number 13. Throughout the movie, we're never told what year we're in or what month, except a few mentions here and there or the newspapers. However, Matt Damon's character General Leslie Groves plays a role of measure of time in the film. Over the course of the film, we see Groves visibly rise through the ranks. He starts off as a colonel as we see no stars on his uniform. And then he gets promoted to a brigadier general with one star. And by the time of the Trinity test, he's a major general with two stars now added to his uniform. This is one of the only visual clues in the movie indicating the passage of time. Number 14. The kitchen curtains at Oppenheimer's house have ginkgo tree leaves on them. Now a group of ginkgo trees famously managed to survive the Hiroshima bombings. Number 15. All the scientists and officials at Los Alamos can be seen wearing round badges with combinations of letters and numbers. These are identification numbers they were assigned upon arriving here. Notice Oppenheimer's badge says K6. And in real life, if you see the archived photo from the Manhattan Project, Robert Oppenheimer was indeed given this K6 badge. Number 16. There's a countdown at Los Alamos to the detonation of the Trinity test, which has a digital display. Now the last number we see here is 43. Now I found it a bit odd that Chris Nolan chose to show us the last remaining seconds as 43 because the time that elapsed after the actual bomb aka Little Boy was dropped and then detonated over Hiroshima was exactly 43 seconds. So this could be Chris's way of incorporating a weird easter egg. Number 17. The film uses actual archived audio of President Truman when he officially announced that the US has dropped an A-bomb on Japan. An American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima. Number 18. The room where Oppenheimer teaches quantum theory is an exact replica of his office from the actual UC Berkeley. The desks seen in this room are the classic old UC Berkeley desks with hard wooden backs and tiny connected writing surfaces. It's an authentic touch that makes it feel extremely Berkeley. Number 19. When Einstein is first shown in the movie from a distance, we can see him throwing a stone. Now it's funny because his last name in German means a stone. Number 20. Albert Einstein is shown walking in the woods with Kurt Godel. The two of them did actually take long walks together as friends at the Institute for Advanced Studies. Number 21. After the meeting between President Truman and Oppenheimer, Truman said this. Don't let that crybaby back in here. Now this line by Truman, don't you ever bring that crybaby back here again, is historically accurate. Truman did really say that to his staff after meeting Robert Oppenheimer. And he also mockingly handed him a handkerchief, as portrayed in the film. In fact, Truman also said, Blood on his hands? I have twice as much on mine. Number 22. When we learn that Jean Tetlock has taken her own life, it deeply shocks Oppenheimer. And as he tries to imagine how she might have died, notice he envisions someone pushing her head into the bathtub while wearing a black glove. Now a lot of people might think that this is Chris Nolan's way of telling us that she didn't take her own life but someone killed her. But I believe there's a deeper meaning here. Since this is happening in Oppenheimer's imagination, the black glove symbolizes his own hand pushing Jean towards her death. This emphasizes the ongoing guilt that Oppenheimer carries within himself. Number 23. At the beginning of the film, Oppenheimer is seen reading T.S. Eliot's apocalyptic poem, The Wasteland. This poem talks about chaos after World War I, touching on themes like renewal, death, barrenness, stalemate, and the tragic drowning of Ophelia. It also mentions how cities are destroyed and the importance of protecting the Holy Grail. Now the film begins with droplets of spring rain, and so does the poem. And the poem ends with a refining fire, a flash of light, and thunder over a ruined world. And a broken man stands standing alone on a shore as uncertainty looms and droplets of rain fall once again. And the film ends exactly that way. And that's it. This movie, my god, although three hours long, but I didn't feel bored even for a second. It not only gives us a history lesson, but also shows us how humanity has come along and how it always manages to destroy itself. Robert Oppenheimer is both a hero and a villain. In fact, in his own words, the bigger the star, the more violent its demise. And that's exactly what happened with him. His relentless hypocrisy gave us the atomic bomb. 
and I guess hypocrisy is not the right word here, but naivety is, because he really believed that an atomic bomb would end all war, not thinking that it could pave the road for something even worse. I'll see you lads in the next one. Now a bonus detail, if you watch all scenes of Florence Pugh at pointy fabric speed, you will suddenly find your dick.